Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Cricket Weekly Podcast. On this week's show, we'll be talking about Fakhar Zaman's extraordinary performance in a losing cause for Pakistan against the Africa the Wanderers. The rest of that series, a bit on West Indies, Sri Lanka. Australia's world record ODI winning streak, Sarah Taylor's playing return, an interview with Sarah Taylor, some IPL stuff and a preview of the county championship. I'm Yaz Rana and with me today is the features editor at Wisdom.com, Tar Hashim, former England batsman Mark Butcher and Wisdom Cricket Monthly magazine editor, Joe Hardman, lots to get through today. Um, Tar, let's start with that extraordinary innings from Fakhar Zaman. He hit 193 off 155 balls to nearly rescue Pakistan from 205 for seven to their target of 342, with just Shaheen Afridi, Harris Ralph and Mohamed Hassanain for company. Um, it's the highest ever ODI score in a run chase. He was a player of the match of the Champions Trophy final nearly four years ago now. He's played one of the all-time great ODI knocks this week, but it feels like he's not done a huge amount in between. Um, an amazing, <laughs> amazing innings from a very interesting cricketer. Yeah, he's had a pretty quiet time late in, in international cricket. I think he's played just the one ODI last year. Pakistan haven't played too many ODIs since the last World Cup. Um, hasn't done much note in T20Is. I, don't, I think he was dropped earlier this year um, when South Africa toured Pakistan. Um, but he is that man in that Pakistan batting lineup who, you know, you look for them, who you look to um, for them to boost themselves up to the 300 plus totals. His his strike rate is just under 100. Um, he's just a hell of a lot of fun to watch. He's he's that one guy you can see in that Pakistan lineup who sort of fits the modern template of what ODI batsmanship should be about. Um, so him finding some, some some form is is pretty important for them. But yeah, you're right. It's been been quite a few years from him mm. uh, he had a bit of a run in the test side did all right against australia but hasn't been seen in that format for two years uh so when i saw that he hit 193 i thought well it's you know it's good to see him back yeah it's an, it an amazing innings, and i know we're, we're all desperate to talk about his run out at the end but before we <laughs> get to that but i feel that we're kind of seeing these kind of innings more often uh where you have an established batsman with a tail ender needing loads of runs at the end mm. of the game there's a obviously um, the Stoyness 146 a few years ago, the Pereira and Stoke test knocks, Sam Curran's 95 we talked about last week. Do you think we're seeing more of them? And, and if so, why do you think that's the case? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I have no idea uh, is the answer. And that's why they pay me the big bucks. <laughs> um, the, yeah, I, I wonder if it's, it's simply because the, um, uh, the, the modern player generally the, the guys that can handle themselves with the bat anyway um, are capable of, of scoring at 10 11 12 and over by themselves um, you know back in the, in the in the old days you would it, you got down to that sort of position and the run rate was up around about eight nights nines or tens and I say old days I mean sort of 10 years ago um, and the, the the established batsman didn't have the power to make all those runs by himself, so he had to rely on the other guy scoring a few, which gave the opposition the opportunity to try and knock them over. And maybe what's happened now is you've got guys who are more than capable of going at 15s by themselves, not having to worry about any sort of contribution at all from the other end. Um, and, you know, being able to sustain that sort of striking over a longer period of time. And I think that's, that's basically what it boils down to. Um, you know, the, we, we mentioned the Sam Curran innings last week. Um, you know, the, it, turning down all of those runs. You know, at the, at the, at the end shake-up, you might say, oh, well, for goodness sake, if you'd have just turned the strike over maybe once or twice more, you might have ended up um, winning the game. But on the other hand, you, you then give the opposition a chance to not, not get the other guy over, don't mm. you? So, I mean, I think that's, that's what it boils down to, really. Um, uh, and you know the, the fact that you also have a lot of run chases well, a lot, lots of times you're chasing 300 um, also gives the scope for that sort of innings doesn't it you're not going to do that if you're only chasing 240 you know the old 50 over score of 240 230 you don't get the opportunity for a guy to come in and have to score that many so there are, there are lots of reasons why you're, you're getting these sort of matches that never die you know they, they kind of get extended forever and ever you thought, thought it was all over it is now but it wasn't until then. Yeah. Um, Joe, I sometimes feel that fielding captains almost don't know what to do in those scenarios because the batsman basically backs himself to hit two boundaries, two sixes and over whatever the field is, whatever the bowling's like. Um, what do you think captains can do to stifle them? Because I think another thing that's interesting about those knocks I, I reeled off is that with the exception of Stokes, you wouldn't really call any of those guys like great to the game. A lot of people, like Sam Curran, we were talking about last week if, he, if, if, if even batting's his strongest suit. Mm. Uh, so what do you think fielding um, captains can do in those situations? Oh, I'm not sure how well, well qualified I am to answer <laughs> that one. 
I think part of the I, I laugh sometimes in T20 because you'll see a, a huddle with the captain and three other players and they'll debate for about a minute like where the fielders should be and then they just launch them over the over the boundary <laughs> and this problem is not just boundary hitting it's six hitting isn't it six hitting is uh, so many batsmen are capable of six hitting that, that fielding's placings become almost irrelevant at times uh, especially when you've got a situation like Faka where he had he had he had license to do exactly whatever he wanted so he could just try and hit hit sixes um, so I'm not sure there is that much that that opposing captains can do really uh, you're very much in the hands of your your bowler and mm. and can he manage to not hit the slot too regularly because you know if he does then he's disappearing out of the grounds you so you touch on a really important point there I think um, you know the, the the argument still rages you still hear people say well it's all the bats isn't it you know that's the only reason well that's not you know guys there were guys capable of hitting the ball long distances hitting huge sixes with the old planks you know Funnily enough, they had good bats back then too. You know, they just look different. Um, the difference is, is that everybody can now do it. You know, everyone can access the the 30th row, whereas in, back in the old days, you'd have one guy in a team that mm. could do that. Um, and that makes captaining and bowling at the death so much more fraught with danger. You just cannot get away with anything. Mm. Um, you know, bowlers trying deliberately to bowl wide. Bowlers trying deliberately to take all the pace off the ball. Bowl it halfway down the pitch on purpose. You know, trying anything they can to try and elicit a miss hit um, and that's you know that's that's what makes I think that's what makes the game so much better now than it used to be I mean I'm not one of those people that goes oh you know I want the bowlers to have a bit more of a say the bowlers have the bowlers have as much say now as they did then you know you end up with you end up taking two big wickets at the back end it doesn't matter if you've gone at sevens or eights before then it's, it's, the, it's the wicket taking it might be one over that wins your team a game mm. um, against you know against some of the, the, the fiercest hitters of the ball that the game has ever seen um, and I think that's it's just such a good point it really is it, and it bears repeating over and over again to people who talk about oh well it's just the bats no it's not it's guys who, who all practice hitting the ball very long distances um, who all have the ability to do it um, I guess and that's con the and point, conditioning though. and conditioning and strength training that goes right the way down the board. You know, I'm sitting. I've got Viv over here to my to my left. Um, you know, he he could hit the ball miles, but now all but all modern batters now look and hit the ball like Viv. You know, whereas he was an outlier. That's the norm. Yeah, T20 batsmen look noticeably different now, don't they? I mean, the size of their arms yeah. are enormous. Yeah. Even someone like Josh Butler, who's not a, he's not a big man, but the, and he obviously times the ball better than almost anyone I've seen. Mm. But those arms are enormous. Yeah, but and a lot of gym work. you watch him, you watch he him himself and somebody like Coley the way that they prepare. They're not they're not doing curls or anything like that. They are squatting vast quantities of, of weight. You know, throwing steel around at, at levels that has, you know that. that Cricket players never used to do it. Sort of rugby style training. It's all in the in the in the arse and in the quads and in the hamstrings, where all this power comes from. Um, so it's not you know yes the bats look better. Your trainers look different than they did in the 1980s. You know not that's really. that, well, yours <laughs> don't. No, sorry, bad example. But you know that's that of course you know there's an evolution in all of those things. But the thing that's changed the most is the way that the players are, not the way that the, the kit that they're using, which is still willow, still cane still rubber and glue it's still made out of the same stuff that albert trot was eating it over the over the <laughs> over the pavilion at lords allegedly allegedly it's, just, it's still the same stuff you know it's not like yeah. carbon fiber has replaced it as it is in tennis or you know the way that golf equipment has evolved it's the same stuff but these guys are not the same stuff they are mm. very very different and while it's a tougher job for bowlers i mean your sort of appreciation just grows for them more when they do make the breakthroughs now so when you watch someone like Joffrey archer in the ipl like barely go for any in the power play against you know everyone who's batting who he's bowling to is you know conditioned to taking it on the power play you know you just it sort of leaves you in a just a bit more all i guess mm. and i guess and, and also what you're saying there is is how much more they're training specifically not just in the gym but technically to hit the sixes mm. as well um we're, we're based the oval and last summer at all, i remember us talking about how much we were, su we were almost surprised at how much they were training for T20 cricket. I know it was a strange season yeah. last year, but the Surrey lot were, were training a lot more for the, the white ball stuff than they were for the red ball stuff. Which yeah, it, did, it didn't show either, did it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in the championship, boy, yeah. how bad. Yeah. Anyway. Um, anyway, but what what is your moment of the week? It's been a very good series so far. The first game was a thriller, but well, moment of the week was <laughs> there's only one, isn't it? Um, the run out um, of, of Faka, the innings, and then then obviously the run out was just a magical, magical moment um, because you know I, I, before long before the the law change what was it forty one point five point five? Yeah, something? it is. 
Is that right? Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, <laughs> the, uh, you know, the, the, the Alex Stewart used to do it all the time. Uh, Stewie would sort of be standing, standing, pretending that the ball was coming to him and watch batsmen dive in from 10 yards and knowing that the ball wasn't going anywhere. Yeah. So this was in reverse. Um, it's, you know, it was, and it was always very funny, very, very amusing. I, I was, um, uh, was a uh, victim of Paul Nixon um, fumbling a ball down the leg side. And part of the, the joy of that was that Nico used to fumble it a lot. You know, no, no, no disrespect, <laughs> but he did. Um, fumbling a one down the leg side of a spinner and going, ah, oh, you know, and then taking a couple of steps like he was going to chase after it. He'd actually gloved it. I took off to go, you know, to, to, to run the, the bye or whatever. And he whipped the bowels off, out, stumped. And all of that was legal. I was very unimpressed. Here, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, you, you were allowed to do that sort of thing now. Um, but with Quentin de Kock, it was, I mean, you know, the way that they all laughed and he was absolutely peeing himself at the end just tells you all you need to know about the fact that he, you know, he took a bit of a bit of a punt and, um, you know, it paid off and he didn't get the five run penalty and Facker was given out. Yeah. Um, but you, there's nothing, nobody can tell me that that was not illegal um, and that Facker should have still been there to, to attempt to, to pull off the impossible with that run chase. Yeah. So and therefore, co- brilliant banter moment for the week. <laughs> It was, yeah, it was, it was definitely very funny. Mm. Um, yeah, just just in case our listeners aren't aware of Law forty one point five, the, the fake fielding law, it states that it is unfair for any fielder to willfully attempt by word or action to distract, deceive, or obstruct either batsman after the striker has received the ball. Mm. According to Clause forty one point five point two, mm. it is for either one of the umpires to decide whether any distraction, deception, or obstruction is willful or not. You said you're not going to have anyone telling you that um, it wasn't deliberate. Um, I think there is a small chance that De Kock was genuinely trying to tell Ngidi to get to the stumps, that he was going to take the ball and he's going to throw it straight away. Um, and I think there is, a, I guess, this, there is a slight problem in the law in that it is very hard to work out if it was deliberate from the fielder. Didn't Bavuma inadvertently acknowledge in the post-match press conference that it was deliberate though. Yeah, yeah I mean, that, listen, that is you, true. That listen, is true. If, you've, if you've played the game, if you've been on the field and you see the, see the reaction of everybody yeah. after it happens, you know, you 100% know, it just yeah. from their reaction, that they'd, they'd, they'd pulled a fast one and everybody knew it. Yeah. especially Quentin de Kock. I mean, you know, uh, F- Facker at the end has sort of said, oh, you know, well, I was worried about the non-street. It doesn't, it actually doesn't matter. I mean, the reason that the law was changed in the first place was because of fielders, you know, slightly. So if you knock one out towards the boundary and whatever, and there are, there's a fielder running backwards towards the ball and to the fence and another fielder running around um, to come and pick it up, the fielder running, running back towards the fence slides and pretends to pick the ball up and throw. And the batter's running between the wickets or catch that out the corner of the eye thinking that he's picked it up and is throwing it back in, and therefore you create that sort of, you know, that split-second hesitation. It might save you a run. It might even cause you a run-out. And so that's the reason that they, that they changed mm. the law. And, I, I, you know, anything that happened up until the law changed, fine, all fair in love and war, a bit of, you know, a bit of shithousery, um, beep, uh, <laughs> you know, whatever you want to call it. But now that there's a law that covers it, illegal should have been, should have been cancelled. But and because of that, it's be, that's what makes it brilliant. Because everyone is going to argue about it forever. So it's one it's, of those. It's a hard one. For, yeah. <laughs> it's a hard one for the umpires to pick up at the time, mm. isn't it? So how should it have been? Are we expecting the umpires to have picked up on it, or should the should there have been a check upstairs? How how should we have got to the right decision? Well, I mean, I, I've seen it once, right? I've, I saw it once, and immediately I kind of knew what was going on, having not you know having not heard anything about about what the, what was happening beforehand. Because I was following the game on Twitter, I wasn't seeing on the TV. So I then went and had a look on the television. And just went, oh my god, how's he got away with that? You know, and the umpire, you know, I don't know. The umpires, be be, umpires, they might be looking. They might be looking at sort of you know guys touching in. Or, mm. you know, it would have been the guy at square leg, wouldn't it? And how he hasn't picked up on what has gone on there, I have no idea. Yeah. I mean, you know, in the in the in the heat of the moment, it's not like the it's not like the um, the World Cup fiasco where apparently the law says that the batsmen need to have crossed before a deflection can count for four runs in that you know when Stokes deflected yeah. the ball mm. nobody no knows knew. that law and, to, and quite <laughs> frankly probably did, how, do you, <laughs> how do you police that I mean that's just it's just it's a nonsense it's a terrible terrible yeah. law another reason why New Zealand feel hard done by mm. and there's been a bit of confusion about what the party line is from South Africa yeah. 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 they've all Bavuma, said different things the, the Vuma said after the game that oh, it was really clever from Decock sort of hinting at the, the fact that it was a deliberate move and then the next day, it's uh, Tavri Shamsi's on Twitter saying uh, Decott was just 
communicating with his teammate at the non striker <laughs> zone or something. So they're sort of changing their tune a bit, I think. No, well. Sh- Shamsi one actually didn't make sense though, because he <laughs> he said that um, he was he was trying to ask a player to back up. Um, at the other end, why would you be pointing at the other end if you're asking for someone to back up? Um, I think also by that stage, just just let it just go. Let it go. Stop. Yeah. Yeah. You've won the game. You've won the and game. And also, great throw. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a fair point. <laughs> yeah, not really being uh, talked about much, but yeah, it was a really good throw. Yeah. Um, but it's been a really good series so far. It's a shame that um, some of the South African players are leaving. Something you've got a bit of flack for on, on yeah, Twitter. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry about that. I mean, I've, <laughs> uh, not only have I have I got the the job as a South African coach and uh, and head of cricket without my knowledge. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I also look after Rhino in my spare time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, sorry, Butch, not Bouch. <laughs> uh, it's been a really good series so far. There was a hundred from Rassi van der Zusen in his first international cricket in the first game, uh, a game won by Pakistan off, off the last ball. But one player that's really impressed me this series is Anrik Nokia. He's been really, really good so far. He got seven wickets across the two games, uh, all of which have been top order batsmen. Um, he he leaves the country for the final game of the series to join up with the Delhi Capitals. He now averages under 20 with the ball in ODI cricket. Mm. Um, he's very good. Um, in the Caribbean, the West Indies Sri Lanka series was a drawn nil-nil series, a stalemate. You don't get many of those anymore, but you're wondering when the last one was. Before I tell you guys, can you guess? Uh, oh, I mean, New Zealand, England had one, eight, but that was quite a long time ago. So that is... Ashes, a l- 29, 29, oh no, it's not a drawn series. Though, so, so, no, no wins. So the New Zealand nil, England nil in 2013 was the last time you had a nil-nil series not involving Bangladesh before this one. Really? So you're pretty close. Well, I, thought um, I, knew, it was, I knew it was... It was a yeah. rarity, yeah. Um, the, the last one was, was South Africa, Bangladesh in 2015, but that doesn't even really count because that took place in the monsoon series in the season... Uh, and uh, only three days of cricket were, were possible across the series. Uh, and there are a couple of others in Bangladesh around that time. But yeah, so the New Zealand-England one is based the last proper one. And there was another uh, record broken in the second Test match. Craig Brathwaite broke the West Indies record for the most minutes batted in a Test match by a West Indian batsman. Uh, eight, uh, 813 minutes, he scored 126 in the first innings and 85 in the second. Um, a decent win of West Indies, uh, four Tests without defeat now in a row. Um, Moving on to another record, this time a world record. Australian women have now won uh, 22 ODIs in a row, a record uh, that's across both men's and women's cricket. They last lost an ODI in October 2017. Taha, it's an incredible achievement, isn't it? Yeah, and I was just looking at some of the sort of individual performances in there. I mean, Alyssa Healy's record since the start of 2018 is just a joke. So 22 ODIs, averaging 57 at a strike rate of 107.93. <laughs> Um, so at least Perry in that same period, I think averages more, but a strike rate of 75, like that's just ridiculous. Um, and yeah, just an astonishing achievement. But I don't want to sound like a total killjoy. Um, You're going to though, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I am. The, everything um, before the bat is nonsense. And this is not to do with the Australian team and what they've been doing, but it's just um, um, watching the record being broken just brought to my mind the interview Charlotte Edwards did with uh, Crick Info. Um, a few weeks ago and talking about one of her concerns which is sort of this is what she said the standard of international cricket is a massive concern there are two or three teams that are really going away from the pack at the moment Um, and so that really sort of was was on sums up my state of mind that's the first thing that came to mind when Mm. I saw Australia ouch but they've played England quite a bit in that as well yeah that's true Um, they've played they've played the teams that that would count as the as the top the top three themselves England, New Zealand. Well, I mean, South Africa are making a bit of a bid. Yeah, but I guess the worry is that, you know, a year ago, Australia were playing India in that final and what's happened with India since and sort of the lack of, you know, lack of help in getting Indian women, Indian, the Indian women side any games. Mm. Is, that's, that's the real concern. Isn't mm. it? I mean, it should be said, New Zealand did manage to beat Australia in a T20 a few days before. I mean, you'd hope these things do yeah. happen, but... They do lose the odd T20 mm. game, even mm. if they don't lose. Yeah. I mean, the, too the, many issue, ODIs. the yeah. issues that, that is professionalism, isn't it? Is kind of like just how how different the um, the the resources and the uh, and the talent pool, all the rest of it, are in in two or three countries compared to everywhere else, and that's the problem. Yeah. That's not Australia's fault, but um, but it does kind of it does lead to to slight disparities but I still think it's an extraordinary record 20 yeah, to 22 games <laughs> on the bounce that takes some doing uh, Joe do you think that the gap between Australia and the rest is closing at all or is it, is it growing larger and larger 
I know Australia have beaten England reasonably comfortably recently, but I don't think the gap is huge there. I think mm-hmm. it's I think it's a couple of players uh, different. I think that the depth in Australian cricket is obviously much much better than English cricket at the moment. But I think that will change. I think that will start to change this summer with the forty one new professional contracts with the women's hundreds. Which whatever you say about the hundred, the women's hundred has got to be a great thing for women's cricket in this country. Um, and you start to see a few more names. Izzy Westbury wrote about this in her column for the latest magazine. We're starting to see a couple more different names in that England side, which hasn't really happened for quite a long time. Got people like Freya Davis coming through, whereas it's just been Brunt and Trubsall for a decade, really. Mm. Partly because they're brilliant, but also partly because they haven't really had that pressure from, from underneath. Um, so I think, I think in, in five years' time, we might well have a situation where Australia and England are way too far ahead of the rest for it to be a competitive overall landscape. Um, and I think India are the ones that can do something about that by actually prioritising women's cricket. They've made lots of good noises, but they haven't really put their money where their mouth is in that regard. Mm, I mean, other than their announcement by uh, the, the secretary of the BCCI, Jay Shah, his, his, his tweet on International Women's Day announcing uh, that there'll be a test match between England and India later this year. I think that took the ECB by surprise. And I think other than that, there haven't been... That wasn't a there will be, that is there will be. Yeah. There will be. <laughs> <laughs> We're telling you. Yeah, the, the, the kind of vibe of it was kind of like, oh, probably should do something today. And woke up <laughs> and tweet it from his personal account. Um, anyway, the, the big news this morning uh, on Tuesday is that Sarah Taylor is returning to top tier professional cricket. Uh, she'll be playing alongside Meg Lanning uh, for the Welsh Fire in the inaugural edition of the 100. Um, it's obviously wonderful news. I spoke to her earlier this week about her return to the game and also her recent experience being part of the Sussex men's coaching setup. Here is that chat. Well, first off, Sarah, great, great to have you back playing. Um, so how, how did the decision to return come about and how long have you been mulling it over? Um, I'd love to say my first hit was end of January. I really can't remember. Um, I think uh, there was loads of things that happened to happen in my life to kind of be put in place um, in order to be okay and feel completely comfortable about accepting this decision. Um, where am I anxiety wise? Where am I? Um, am I grounded? I'm, I'm all these things. And I had to tick a lot of boxes. Um, not forced, obviously. It's, it's not being forced. It's been a gradual um, kind of succession, really, uh, of all those things to be ticked off. So, um, yeah, I had, I did have an offer last year uh, by Welsh Fire, actually. They can, yeah, well done from them. Um, and uh, yeah, so. Yeah, the, the offer was there, um, but I wasn't in a place to, to play at all. And, and I said that, and I was very honest with him. Um, and I said that to Motti, you yeah, know, I'm, I'm not in a place, but by all means, think about me next year and, and see what happens. So he did, and he asked. And um, yeah, and like I say, I was in a much better place. Um, I'd had the hit, I felt good. Um, I'm not scared of cricket anymore. And I know that sounds a little bit bizarre, but... Um, I'm, I'm kind of up for the fight and up for the challenge now um, rather than kind of shying away from it, which I think I, I got to. That was the place I was at uh, towards the end of my career. So um, international career, I'm still going. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, so I'm just happy about being back and um, hopefully it'll be good fun. So what, what prompted you to, to have that hit? Because it sounded like you hadn't played for quite a long time. So, so yeah, what, why did you pick up the bat, dust, uh, dust the bat off and, and get, get into the middle again? Um... I missed it. And I never thought I'd say that. Uh, I did miss it. You know, I'm, I'm coaching at a school. I'm, I'm clawing all day. Um, I'm working with wiki keepers. And at some point I was like, well, why are they having all the fun? Um, I might give this a go. Um, again, dusted my bag, like the cobwebs off. And then all of a sudden I thought, right, okay, just give it a go. I've got nothing to lose here. If I'm terrible, does it, what does it matter? If I do all right, well, let's consider things. Um, and it was a case of, I did all right. And I was like, do you know what? Actually, I've not lost it at all. Um, and then, yeah, the offers were there. And then it was quite a, a simple decision from then. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's been an interesting journey the last couple of months, kind of um, trying to get back to think about what I need for a, for a cricket match. Uh, like keeping socks. <laughs> uh, that I needed to get keeping socks again. So... Um, yeah, it's been it's been good fun, um, kind of getting back into that headspace of, of playing cricket again. Mm. Um, there's been a lot of noise about the hundred for, for a few years now. As a player who's now going to be involved, 
um, how, how excited are you to be playing alongside and against some of the very best players in the world? I mean that's obviously a draw. That's a that's a draw to play in it. Um, you want to challenge yourself against the best, um, and you also want to have three of the best Australian players um, on your team, which is very nice. Um, but yeah, look, it, it's a draw for me, a draw for players, and it's it's a draw for everyone watching, isn't it? Um, what is it? Eight eight teams, eight teams, um, seven cities, isn't it? Yeah, seven cities. So um, it's now, it's just so nice for that to be, well, to be a part of it, really. I mean, look, it's easily accessible, isn't it, for, for everyone going. Um, I hope we can get crowds. I would absolutely love if we can get crowds back. Um, that's the dream, isn't it? Um, mainly because if I am on the boundary, I can actually sign things now. Um, I couldn't do that before when I was right next to the wicket. So um, it would just be nice to yeah play in front of a crowd, play in front of, in a new tournament, new face, kind of new kit, new names. Um, yeah, and uh, hopefully it's good. Hopefully it'll be a massive success. Mm. You, you talked a lot about your um, coaching and how, how you're enjoying it and the satisfaction you get from it. How have you found it um, with, with working with the Sussex men's first team? Oh, amazing. I'm learning every single day. Um, at the Oval yesterday, just walking around the boundary with James Kirtley, who's got hundreds of wickets, first-class cricket. Ian Saul, like Saul speaks for himself, doesn't he? England, Sussex, sorry. He's an unbelievable player. So um, just learning off of them, um, and it's nothing to do with keeping. Um, I was even, Alex Stewart was out working with Folksy. I don't even think I watched any part of the game. Uh, I was watching that. Um, just seeing what they were doing. Um, it's just, I couldn't be in a better position to learn the art of coaching. Um, uh, Ian Salisbury talks um, very much about, they're not going to remember, I think, I think oh, I'm going to quote him now, he'll love this. Um, I'm pretty sure he said, um, they're not going to remember it if you teach them a cover drive, but they'll remember how you made them feel. And I'm a massive believer in that. Um, and I love the ethos that they've got there at Sussex. So, yeah, love being a part of it. Brownie is an absolute angel to work with. Um, he's all about enjoyment, which is which is perfect for me. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't think of being anywhere else at all. Um, there aren't many women coaching in professionals, men's sport, let alone cricket. Do you, do you feel like a trailblazer? <laughs> uh, do I feel like a... No, because I feel like one of the lads. Um yeah, that kind of word keeps getting thrown around. Um, I don't feel like one, but I'm hoping, hope, I really hope I'm not the last one, uh, the last female to, to be a part of, as a coach, um, as a part of the staff of, of, a, men's, of a men's team. So, um, yeah, uh, like, I mean, I think in Australia it, it is about, I think Julia Price, I think, was part of a men's team. But I think keeping lends itself a little bit, um, a little bit easier to kind of go in in that role. Um, but I don't see why, in terms of cricket knowledge and the game itself, I don't see why more females can't be part of the coaching staff in, in men's teams. Um, and I will happily 100% push for that. Um, but yeah, like I said, hopefully I'm not there. Um, Amelie Moresbo, who coached Andy Murray for a little bit, said that when she first got into coaching um, in men's tennis, that she she felt like, she had to do a little bit more to be respected and it wasn't quite as easy for her because because she's a woman. Um, what would you say to other women in cricket who might be thinking about coaching men's cricket and might be a bit hesitant going into that, having heard other women's experience in the past? Look, I think you've got to back your skills and back what you're about. I think you have to be 100% true to yourself. I'm very much someone that likes to enjoy my coaching. Um, I like... Um, the person that I am coaching to really throw themselves into, into what we're doing. Um, I did learn that, you know, you get one little nugget into, into a player's head um, and then they're kind of with you on that journey. They're, they're all of a sudden there. So, and I, I don't think that is um, a men's thing. I think that's any player that you work with. So yeah, I was really, really lucky that um, Brownie took to me very quickly. Um, I've known him since I was 14 well, that's a while back now. So, um, and we were on the academy together. So we're exactly the same age. So it's a little bit of a weird dynamic, but um, yeah, he 
he could see what I had to offer and, and he was quite open with that. But I would, I would genuinely say to any woman that is considering those options to 100% back yourself. You have to trust that you are good enough um, and not believe kind of any of the hype that women aren't because, because we are. Um, and I've had the experiences to back that up. I know where I'm not ashamed to say that I've got where is to work on um, and I will push myself on those. And that's why I'm trying to learn as much as possible from other coaches. So um, yeah, I would say 100% back yourself. Uh, and final question for me, uh, slightly, slightly differently. Um, do you have one piece of advice to kids who are returning to the game this summer after a very long winter without playing it? Oh, a bit cliche to say enjoy it, isn't it? That is rubbish. I think you have to look at the, the year that we've had and appreciate the sport. I have, I'm now, I appreciate the sport now because, um, yes, I've been lucky to coach, but... Um, I've obviously been away from it for a little bit longer than most, so I'm just kind of, um, I can't wait to get back out there and enjoy it and just take every game as it comes because who knows what's going to happen. Who knows? Joe, what's your moment of the week? Uh, my moment of the week was a viciously turning leg break from an Australian spinner who England might possibly be seeing a bit of later this year. Um, this is Mitchell Swepson, who we've talked about on the show maybe a few months back. He had a brilliant start to the Sheffield Shield season. And then had a stress fracture in his neck, which sounds uh, a nasty Painful. injury. Yeah, so he's meant to be out for the rest of the season, but it's come back quicker than expected. Return for Queensland's most recent match against New South Wales, who are likely to be the two finalists. Uh, he took a couple of wickets, was a bit expensive in the first innings, but took four for 60 in the second innings. But it was one ball in particular. Um, bowling round the wicket, uh, left-handed Daniel Hughes tossed it kind of well wide above stump. It would have... If it continued on its trajectory, it would have probably been a wide in a one-day match. That's how wide it was. Turns viciously out of the out of the rough and ends up knocking back his leg stump. So it's come back a hell of a long way. Um, and Swepson said himself afterwards, he, he felt like it was a half-tracker when he let go of it. But it was considerably better than that. Um, and then he... T- uh, actually, Daniel Brettig of Crick Info compared it to Warren getting Shanderpool at the SCG in 1996. They went back and looked at that footage and there is definite similarities there. Uh, Swepson's now taken 29 wickets at 22 in the Sheffield Shield. Wow. Uh, yeah, and he's, it's starting to become quite an interesting selection dilemma there for Australia because, I mean, you can't, you can't doubt Lyon's record, but he, he, he didn't have a good uh, series against India. Uh, a couple of fifth days that didn't go his way. Um, it should be said, <laughs> Lyon took six wickets in this match and was named player of the match, so it's not <laughs> like he's a busted flush, but... Uh, Brettig again said that, uh, that's the sort of thing that Lyon for all his virtues just can't offer uh, after Swepson and bowled that mm. delivery and, and you do see that and it's interesting with that Australian attack how do you balance it because you've got such good uh, such a good pace attack does that give you the luxury of throwing in a leg spinner who can just produce mm. those deliveries or if, do you think you need to maximise those, those pace bowlers so you need a, a, a steady bowler like Lyon who's just going to eat up overs and, and won't go for too many? If, if, they have, if they have a fourth seam bowling option in green, then you might say, OK, we might be able to throw in a guy who can, who can, who can leak a little bit. Mm. But, you know, a four man, the traditional Australian four-man pace attack is based around a spin bowler being able to, to, being able to hold as well as take lots of wickets yeah. because you need you have to give um, Hazelwood Stark and uh, and Cummins a rest you know you have to be able to hold an end down while those guys rotate otherwise you need the fourth bowler the fourth seamer so I would imagine that Lyon's got a little bit of time left in yeah. him just uh, just yet and he, he uh, does pretty well against England in Australia it, as well well so exactly I mean he's I mean he's a, he's a stunningly good bowler on, on pitches where finger spinners have, have really found life difficult um, you know the, the overspin and the, and the control of length and, and flight that he has has meant has meant that he's, you know, and, and he does those things. You know, he'll, he'll bowl you out in the final final two days of a Test match, and he'll and he'll go for none. You know, or he'll take wickets, forcing batsmen to try and have a go at them mm. by being uh, by being accurate and over the first three days. So, um, you know, unless if he breaks a finger, then great. I mean, it'd be brilliant to see a, a, a hard spinning leggy in mm. an Australian side again. Won't it, sort of. Yeah, <laughs> careful what you wish for. Um, uh, but also, Swepson's only 27, Lyon's 33. So whether it's this winter or it's further down the line, it, mm. it is starting to look like this This guy might be the future, which is great for leg spin bowling because we see stacks of them in T20 cricket. Every good side's got one or, or possibly even two. Uh, 
but there aren't many leg spinners around in Test cricket. Obviously, you've got Rashid Khan at, at, um, for Afghanistan, but he's Yassir pretty... Shah still. Yassir Shah, that's true. But there aren't many about. Yeah. Uh, and the few that do play often have a, a challenging time. So it'll be fascinating to see how he goes. One thing that is interesting about someone like Swepson doing so well recently is that, we, I know we talked about this before in the podcast, but Australia don't have any Test cricket before the Ashes. I think they might have one Test against Afghanistan at home. England have seven test matches, so there's plenty of time for England to chop and change. And I'm not saying having seven test matches against the best two teams in the world, according to the IC rankings, is necessarily a great thing. Mm. could cause more problems than it, than it solves. But it does mean Australia don't really have time to, to uh, try things out in test cricket before, before the first test of that series. Yeah, which probably doesn't count in Swepson's favour. I think he'll, he'll be in a squad. Lyon will be the first choice spinner. But who knows, if the first test doesn't go Lyon's way... If Australia lost the first test, then suddenly the clamour is going to start for a leg spinner who turns it like that. And and, yeah. and also, I mean, you've we've seen England against the turning ball this winter. Mm. It doesn't always look pretty. Yeah. Uh, could they end up preparing an Ahmedabad <laughs> pitch and playing, playing two of them? Probably not. You, but. <laughs> you watch, you, you see the, the uproar of that happening <laughs> in Australia. Oh my God. Uh, well, since Lyon made his test debut, I don't think Australia have played a wrist spinner in test cricket. Yeah, I think, I think that that's right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, at least he comes into the equation. Manus Labuschagne. <laughs> <Right. laughs> yeah, that's true. It wasn't Steve a round at start, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think we might be getting a little bit too far ahead of ourselves if we're imagining I, I think so. England going one 0 up and then throwing everything out there. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I, I'm going to go with my moment of the week next. Um, this is an interview on cricket.com.au with Ricky Ponting about Prithvi Shaw, um, specifically about his training habits in last year's IPL. Uh, in case you need reminding, Shaw was, was a bit out of nick and was eventually left out the Delhi side that Ponting coaches. Um, so this is what Ponting said about coaching Shaw. Um, he had an interesting theory on his batting last year. When he's not scoring runs, he won't bat. And when he is scoring runs, he wants to keep batting all the time. He had four or five games where he made under 10. And I'm telling him, we have to go to the nets and work out what's wrong. And he looked me in the eye and said, no, I'm not batting today. I couldn't really work that out. <laughs> he, he, he might have changed I know he's done a lot of work over the last few months that theory he had might have changed and hopefully it has because if we can get the best out of him he could be a superstar I was going pretty hard at him I was basically telling him mate you've got to get in the nets whatever you think you're working on it's not working for you it's my job as a coach to challenge someone's preparation if they're not getting results so I challenged him and he stuck to his word and he didn't practice much at all towards the back end of the tournament and he didn't get many runs towards the back end of the tournament either. <laughs> I also um, didn't pick him. <laughs> <laughs> um, since then, Shaw averaged 165 with a strike rate of 138 in the recent <laughs> Vijay Hazare trophy, the, the 50 over competition in, in India. Uh, so whatever he's done since, he's done the trick. Um, but if, if, if you ever come across a player who's had a similarly weird uh, approach to training? Marcus Trescothic wouldn't bat on batting days. I mean, he you know he would practice obviously yeah. in the in the lead up to a test match, but if um, so, obviously you don't know if you're batting or bowling on day one. But during the during the course of that test match, knowing that he was going to be batting that day, he wouldn't he wouldn't hit the ball. He'd go out and take a few slip catches, do a warm up, and whatever, and then go and sit down. But other than no, I, I mean, you know, I, I can't see people. I can remember people sort of trying to step away. Um, uh, from from practicing or you know just disappear away from the game for a little while, but to have that as your as your tried and trusted method of things not going very well. Okay, I'm never batting again. You know that could that could last forever. <laughs> that's that's it. You never never picked up another bat. So when do you decide? Uh, you know how many bad scores does it take before you actually yeah. decide? Oh, I'm, I might actually have to do a bit of batting here. <laughs> Would you have had the? Uh Self-confidence at 21 to say to some <laughs> to of Ricky the Ponting. stature of Ricky Ponting, no, no, I'll do it my way, thanks. <laughs> no, I mean, that's another another thing, isn't it? This sort of... Um, that's yeah. someone who's brought, been brought up being told that he's a seriously good player. Right? <laughs> I also, yes, if you're I Ricky Ponting... There's not a lot of accountability or, you know, he, or he doesn't take much doesn't take much persuading from anybody. He's, he is the, the business and he will tell you so. Didn't he wear, he wear 100 on the back of his shirt at the Under-19 World Cup? I think so, yeah. I, I, I'm trying to imagine if you're Ricky Ponting in that situation, you, you're probably not used to young players disagreeing with you much, especially when they're not getting any runs and just being told throughout, no, I'm not going to back. <laughs> is that, is, was it a video interview or was it uh, written? I've only seen it I'd written. I'd be interested to see what Ricky Ponting looked like, as you were saying, but I, it felt like there were some heavy inverted commas over interesting theory yeah. at the start. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very well, fair point. I've been spewing. I'd, I'd, yeah. I'd know him pretty well, you know, and it, it, everything was about sort of, you know, work ethic, work hard, you know, you don't work less you work harder 
Yeah. Um, so I, I can imagine that, that when the the time came for him to drop the axe on the, on the young man, he wasn't shedding too many tears about it. Right, that, that's, that's your idea, you're gone. <laughs> Owen, Owen Morgan's talked about not facing that many balls when he's in a bad trot because it doesn't help him. Mm. But then that's something, he wasn't saying he did that at 21. He said that he's worked out over the course of his career, that's what works for him at different points. Mm. That's very different to being, I'm 21, I know exactly the best thing to do, which, mm. um, you know, he's obviously yeah, a player. I mean, you know absolute... You know nothing at 21. <laughs> Pop, unless you're Sachin, I suppose. <laughs> but I reckon he, he would have had a bat, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. That, that was definitely true. Um, <laughs> anyway, anyway, the county championship, as hard as it might be to believe, given it's currently one degree Celsius outside, that actually begins this week. Um, on last week's show, but you laughed at my prediction that Kent might win it. Openly um, laughed. Openly laughed in my face. Um, Joe, we'll start with you. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry, I, I, I did it again. Uh, uh, Joe, let's start with you. Who, who do you think are going to win the thing? Um, I think for about the last six years, I've backed Somerset, so I've decided to give the poor blokes a break. And uh, to be honest, if I was putting some money on it, I would probably go for Essex. I just think they they just win in difficult situations where it just doesn't look like they should, and that, that counts for a lot. But I do think looking at Yorkshire's squad, I think it looks really strong this year. I think it looks the best it has done since they last won the championship. Um, signing of Don Best is an interesting one I don't think he's going to play test cricket this summer unless he takes a lot of wickets maybe maybe towards the back end if he has a good season so you'd think they'll get a lot out of him that pace attack Ben Code just takes loads of wickets every year plenty of cricket in April same for Steve Patterson and then you've got uh, Dwayne Olifair uh, who's got a bit of pace about him so that's quite a nice balanced attack those four there and in the batting you've got I think Gary Balance is back after missing last year through stress related illness um, you've got Johnny Bairstow I think he's going to play a fair amount of red ball cricket I don't see him playing test cricket either mm. and he's got, got the IPL though I guess he has but uh, when he comes back but when he comes yeah. back there's still a, a decent chunk there and, and the same for David Milan when he comes mm. back from the IPL so those three uh, are three batsmen who always score runs in county cricket when they play really and mm. there aren't many batting units there's loads of great bowling attacks around the country or loads of very effective bowling attacks there aren't that many batting lineups you think can can kind of regularly post 300 plus mm. and I think Yorkshire at their, at their strongest will but you're right Best and Milan away for a, for a while is, is, is they might find themselves in a position after four weeks where they're almost out of the race but they need a couple of batsmen like Adam Lythe Tom Kyler Cadmore there's, there's talented batsmen there um, so I think they might be in amongst it what, one thing that I I'll admit I didn't take into consideration when I did my prediction for the magazine is how the new format might affect it and the, the, the fixture split so just to run through it, there are three groups of six, and the top through from each, top two from each group go into Division One. Uh, the winner of that Division One wins the championship, and there's a two day, uh, there's a two team, uh, five day final at Lords with the Bob Willis Trophy. But you could have some teams, and Yorkshire possibly fall in this category with with, with Root in particular, um, where you have really good availability the first bit of the season, which is the group phase. You get into Division One, and you might not have those Test players for much or any of the um, actual Division 1. Mm. So I, I did predict Kent kind of thinking that oh, Cordy's going to play loads, but actually he's, he's not going to play the that much. If any, yeah, Well, exactly. I probably should have mentioned Joe Root when I was talking yeah. about Yorkshire's good yeah. match. He's quite good, isn't he? He's quite good, yeah. But you have, so Joe Root will be there to start with, then he will obviously go and play Test cricket, but then you could potentially have Bairstow and Milan coming in. So there's, there's quite a nice mm. balance there. Taha, what do you think? Um, it's a pretty boring call, but I'll... I just don't see any reason as to why Essex can't win it again. Um, so we're talking about availability, availability in national call-ups. Essex don't really have that mm. issue. Mm. You know, they don't have guys at the IPL. They've got the best ca- um, batsman in the country who doesn't play international cricket anymore. Alistair Cook. Um, still- best off spinner in the world, according to him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Not far off, though. Yeah. Probably. Um, they've got yeah, they've got a phenomenal attack. I reckon Tom Wesley surely has a few more runs in him this year after struggling a bit last year. Um, my dark horses are Kent. Um, I do like the look of their batting lineup when Crawley's there. Um, I also quite enjoy the romance of Darren Stevens winning the whole thing. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> it's Essex, Essex for me, yeah. Mm. Mm. Uh, Birch, what do you reckon? Well, I, 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 I'm struggling to, to nail down a winner. I mean, Essex do put together a pretty compelling case. However, I know from uh, from experience that winning three out three on the bounce is some feat, you know, hasn't been done 
it's not when was the last time it was done was it yorkshire in the 60s or yeah, something yeah yeah um so you know that that takes some doing um in itself so i've, I've basically gone I've, I've got a bit of a wild card i've got my top two from each of the uh groups isn't it yes it's the groups right so i've been trying to get my head around this for ages and it still hasn't quite gone in yet but i've got i've so i've got essex and and knots knots who haven't won a, a four-day game since 2018 to go through from that's bold from group one but they've got a good side <laughs> they haven't have they? got yeah, a good side yeah. yeah and and you, i'm looking at the rest of the group and sort of thinking well surely mm. you know um uh group two i've gone for somerset and surrey i mean somerset well they've been runners up five out of the last six in the championship all the years i pick him yeah yeah <laughs> And yeah, you know, and they've still they still never won it, have they? Yeah, never won it. Never won it. So they'll come second in their group. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> with, with, if there's if there's any if there's any justice in the world, yeah, yeah. they'll no they'll they'll come second in the whole thing. No, which me, you know. So I've gone for Somerset and Surrey. I think Surrey, um, Kemal Roach is a really exciting mm, signing for them. Very good signing. The season. Um, they'll see quite a bit of uh, the likes of Ollie Pope. Um, you know, run scoring has been a bit of an issue for them, so it'd be good for them to have him about. Rory Burns has probably got a point to prove as well. Um, you know he's not, and he's not guaranteed. I don't think he's guaranteed to sort of to to be in the top order for come the test matches. We'll get into that in a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that's so I had no idea, <laughs> but right. there we go. Um, uh, so you know, so he's got a point. So there should be runs there, um, and obviously having a Singh Verdi with the, this sort of pushing. You know, anybody that hasn't played test match cricket who can bowl spin half decently is pushing, aren't they? I mean, mm. let's, let's, let's face it. So, um, you know, the, 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 they Somerset and Surrey and then Group 3, Yorkshire, Yorkshire and Kent. I mean, sorry, I mean, it, it just burst out. I couldn't help myself. <laughs> but, um, yeah, Yorkshire Yorkshire looked to be by far the strongest team in, yeah. uh, in Group 3 and might, you know, they might have a chance of running away with the whole thing. Yeah. It's, and I, I think Kent are, are, are certain to go through to... Uh, to Division One, so that that's I, I've sat on the fence simply because I don't because the championship is too difficult a thing to win to sort of th- just to throw mm. it out there. Oh, Essex mm. are going to win three out of three. Mm. Yeah, yeah, they could, and yeah, they probably should, but will they? I don't know. Mm. One team I'll, I'll I'll add in that we've not mentioned so far, Hampshire. Yeah, I was going to um, say the same. Mm. Decent new ballers. Yeah, uh, uh, Abbott and Nabas is a pretty handy yeah. ball pair, and then yeah. Vince Northeast. Uh, they'll they'll, they'll they be better. They've signed Keith Bar- Barker as well, haven't they? Has he been? They've, yeah, yeah, they've yeah. still got. Barker. He was there last he year. Yeah. Last yeah. was injured he was for injured quite a chunk of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Liam Dawson back will be back from injury. Mm. Well, that's a, that's a, it's a pretty good Mason side. Crane yeah, as yeah. well. So it's going to come on to in a bit. So it's a good side and, and possibly the weakest group as well. Um, may, maybe that 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 group one as well. Uh, Lancashire and Sussex in in Group Three can make things interesting. Um, but yeah, I'm, I think it's uh, all to play for. Obviously, um, Ty, are you going to say something? No. Cool. <laughs> cool um we've got a few questions <laughs> you're just so. sitting there like a goldfish <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> um we've got a few questions one's from sam dawling related to what you just said a few moments ago butch um do you think these first few rounds of the county championship could push new names into england contention or is that unrealistic if someone like uh a tom lamb a tom lamby scores heavily can they force their way in or will it be two of the last squad opening the batting regardless what do you think i, I think I think Sibley Sibley is for sure, and I think um, Crawley Crawley's spot for me is number three. I think he's I see him there in uh, time stretching forward, and um, you know I, I don't have any issue with those two players um, at all. Rory Burns, I mean it wasn't so long ago that he you know averaged almost forty against that Australian attack mm. here at home, and it looked like he'd made a massive breakthrough. And that the injury that he had in um, in, in Johannesburg. Um, in the build-up to the, uh, the the South Africa, well, it was between the first and second test yeah. matches, wasn't it? In South Africa, kind of you know put put this, put him under the skids and has put him under a bit of pressure. Um, and you know, being that being that he plays the way that he plays, you kind of you, you, all it takes is for a few low scores, and everyone's kind of on his back and saying he shouldn't be in the side. So, look, the selectors might see it completely differently. They might back him to the hilt, and he'll be back in the side again, having been left out in India. But I think there's there's room there for for there's always room for an improvement in your top three, isn't there? Particularly given the way that England sort of middle order likes to play. So yeah, I mean somebody like Lamaby, um, Hamid, can he can he make good on the promise of what was it 2016? Um, you know, he's part of the reason why I thought Knotts might be might be a, a good a good bet for going through in Group One. Um, and so there are there are one or two guys, Nick Gubbins. Can it, you know he can have a good year for, for Middlesex. He's another guy who I think has got sort of like the, the at least the technique, perhaps to make a, a, a go of it at the top level. 
So it's look, for sure, one place out of three is up for grabs, I think. On, on uh, Hamid, given the struggles he's had, do you think England selectors will look him, even if he said reeled off two or three hundreds in the first few weeks, do you think England selectors would be sensible to think he needs a full season of this before we, we rush him back? Or yeah. do you think because of what he did in India when he just looked like a test batsman, yeah. they're going to be more inclined to, to bring him back in. I don't know. I mean, look, it's, we're, starting, we're starting the championship before the 10th of April again. The weather's horrendous. Um, you know, you could have... If the, if the bowlers end up being on top everywhere and, a couple, and one batsman goes out there and makes three, four hundreds in challenging, in challenging conditions, yeah. you'd say, well, hang on, you'd, you'd have to take notice of that, wouldn't you? You'd have to. Mm. Um, and you're right. He, I think it, there, there is a little bit of credit in the bank. I mean, it's, it's distant. It's dim and distant. Mm. Um, but he certainly, as, as you said, I, I watched him then and I'd watched him play in, in England under-19 cricket beforehand and just thought he's just so much better than everybody else at his age at playing the way that he plays. You know, great idea of where he's off stump is, leaves the ball play straight, etc. So, look, I'm a, I'm a fan. Um, mm. But he has, to, he has to prove it beyond reasonable doubt, I think. Ty, you're a fan of Lamanby. I know a lot of people are, but you really are a big <laughs> fan of Lamanby. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of interested to see what he can do over the course of a full season. So last year was sort of his first proper season with Somerset's first team and, you know, three hundreds on the bounce, one against Essex at Lords. Like, he, he looks a special player. He's already got one this season as well in the warm-up games. Yeah, that's right. And he's kind of, if the ECB were in a lab trying to create the perfect cricketer for, say, 2021, you'd probably go Lamanby. Um top order red ball batsman um, then in T20 cricket he's sort of a low order hitter who strikes at 150 and then he bowls a bit left arm pace as well um, so he's kind of he's he seems like a sort of a bolter for, for all formats and um, yeah I think especially what's interesting is that you know he wasn't an opener till last season he barely opened in club cricket and he's just taken to it so naturally but then he can he's played different different innings with different tempos the one against Worcester was different to the one against Essex he kind of seems like he's just a very adaptable cricketer so yeah he's he's mm. definitely the one to watch for me and and he spoke to him last night not last night was <laughs> not, no, he didn't he spoke to him recently yeah. recently just finding out a bit, finding a bit more about him and yeah I just saw the whole thing about him basically being approached over from the batting because there was no space in the middle order and just taking to it so easily is, is quite remarkable really when we look at opening the batting in this country as probably the toughest kick there is yeah that's, that's it, what i did you know <laughs> made my debut batting at eight and, and bowling first change and ended up because nobody else wanted to do it so yeah he's got a big future yeah. that kid <laughs> <laughs> it did last summer it did have the look of a kind of sacrificial lamb to it didn't it when they yeah. threw him up up top uh, so to come through like he did was was pretty impressive what no one else scored 300s in the tournament i think need to double check that but possibly pretty sure um, that's true yeah, yeah um Tom asks, I know we've talked about a couple of them already, but best young players to watch in the county championship? He suggests James Coles and Tawanda Muyeye, who we talked about a little bit last week. Jack Coles is the uh, Sussex 16-year-old who debuted last season. Bowls a bit of left arm spin, bats to the top six. So uh, any names who we've not mentioned yet already that um, haven't played for England? That's the one rule. They don't have to be that young, but they, okay. they can't play for England. Well, I mean, Butch touched on it, but with, with Verdi, I'm, I'm interested to see how he does. Especially now, because uh, of last summer, he bowled really well. But then you've got Moriarty as well, the left arm spinner, Rob Key's favourite player. Exactly, and whether they can form, <laughs> whether they form spin duo or it's just one of them at the start of the season, which is most likely it's yeah. April, um, and just to see how he progresses because he's he's got an excellent red ball record. I think he's got ninety something wickets in twenty something games at a pretty low average. Um, but I so I spoke to Simon Harmer um, last month and just asked him to pinpoint a few spinners to watch out for and he really talked up Verdi but also said that he didn't think he, he's surprised that Verdi's not kicked on as you know Harmer thought he would um, which is interesting when he's actually done he's got yeah, a record's pretty good, pretty good record record's really yeah. good. Um, and the other one that Harmer mentioned who he's really impressed by is Jack Carson who's at Sussex who's 20 years old um, from Northern Ireland uh, and was Sussex leading wicket taker last, last year and he just said that you know you can either Harmer said you can either really rip it as a bowler or you can't and, and Carson's got it um, mm. so he's he's one to watch out for definitely especially under in Salisbury there as well mm. Joe? Yeah not necessarily that new a name but one for me George Garton at Sussex who's been around for a few years now I think he's uh, only 23 though um, he was you might remember he was taken to Australia as a net bowler 
because um, they wanted to basically have a left arm quick available. I think Mitchell Johnson's still fresh in their memory from the previous tour. But he was one of those bowlers. I think he was kind of fast before he was particularly good. I think his speed came before his skills. But it seems over the last few years, the skills are starting to catch up. He's also a much better batsman than he was. Um, I think I think perhaps white ball cricket might be his, his best route into international cricket if that does indeed happen. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see he's genuinely quick around the 90 mile hour mark. Uh, he kind of led Sussex, Sussex attack last year with Ollie Robinson on, on England duty for a lot of it. Uh, so we were interested to see how he goes in combination with Robinson. I think that's a, an interesting new ball attack. I guess they'll take the new ball together. Um, so he's one to, to keep an eye on, I think. Mm. But I've, got, I've got a few. I've, Josh Tung is sort of fit again at Worcester. Mm. I mean, I know he's he's been on the radar. He's been on fast bowling academies and all that kind of stuff, but he's pretty exciting. Um, Lewis Rees, who's kind of like the, he's Derby's sort of number one man in you know the yeah. all action sort of all rounder. So he so he opens the batting and the bowling. Yeah, yeah. He's, so he's, I was trying to think proper what, Billy Wiz. I was trying to think. Can you think of other county cricketers in your time that have done? I mean, it's kind of like school cricket, isn't it? It's just no, the best player. Well, there was, um, uh, what's the play, did it for Warwickshire? Um, left armer. Oh, Neil Carter. Neil Carter yeah. in sort of played in the forty over games, opened the batting yeah. and opened the bowling. Um, but yeah, cricket's pretty unusual. Um, isn't yeah. it? I've got one. Uh, I've mentioned him on the show before. I interviewed him recently, and uh, that article go online shortly. Um, but I really like Matt Milnes at Kent. I think he's someone who um, the last couple of ca- county championship seasons have been a bit weird because uh, the yeah, the the World Cup in 2019 that was going on in the background almost, and last year a lot of it happened during the Test series, etc., um, because of COVID. Um, but he was a leading English seamer uh, in terms of wickets in 2019 in Division One. Um, he's very interesting to talk to. He said that basically got a lot better after um, um, working with Alan Doddled, which which obviously helps. Um, but yeah, I think he's 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 one to keep an eye on this season. Been on been on England Lions tour. Um, uh, final thing I want to talk about with the county championship is we've talked a little bit about the format already, but specifically in relation to the England Test team, uh, a lot was made of how English players might not have been um, as well prepared for the conditions they got in India as they <laughs> could have been. Yes. Um, and the, now Indi- the Indian players weren't, weren't prepared for that either. That's true, that's true, that's true. Um, you know, uh, we, we most most to... of their guys averaged under 24 that, as well. That is true, that is true. Um, um, but how, how much do you think having so much of the season taking place before June impacts the development of English cricketers for all conditions? Well, I interviewed Mason Crane uh, last week uh, who... I mean, this time last year or a bit earlier, his Red Bull prospects were looking pretty bleak because they'd just signed Hampshire, just signed Nathan Lyon, and I think Crane was a bit perhaps surprised to see that happen. I mean, this is England's obviously played for England already. Mm-hmm. Suddenly, looked like he didn't have much of a Red Bull future. Lyon didn't come last year. Crane ended up having a really good Bob Willis, fourteen wickets at fourteen, I think, mm-hmm. and he was saying his confidence was starting to come back. And then he said almost in passing, and it was great bowling in August, <laughs> and obviously. I mean, yeah, of course it is for a leg spinner, Um, but that's not really going to happen much at all this summer. So I think it makes a a huge difference. How how can you stake your claim for it to be a leg spinner for England when you're bowling that many games in April and May? Mm. Uh, Or not not bowling. Or not bowling. Or you're watching Carl Abbott and Mohamed Abbas. (laughs) There's not really many wickets left to (laughs) take, I don't think. Uh, So I think think it makes a huge difference. And having said that, I don't know what the answer is. There's just too, as we said last week, there's too much cricket. Mm. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, you've all, you've always had the issue, or you always had the, the the idea that you know, oh, we should do more to prepare pitches of such and such in order to. You tour India once every four years, or whatever it mm. might be. Whatever you do, with the exception of perhaps um, cricket against Australia, where whereby the the cricket shouldn't be that different between here and there. Yes bounce and pace are slightly different but it shouldn't be that different um preparing for specific tours is just kind of it's a fool's game in, mm. in, in the, the english game so what you would like to have is a season whereby you know the, the seamers are on top to begin with batting becomes a lot more fun and, and joyous sort of come june june july and then the spinners get their go towards the end and that's you know the, the english cricket has always kind of sorted itself out along the lines that you will get differing conditions throughout the, 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 the four and a half, five months of the, of the year. But we're not going to get that now. We just don't have that because you, you'd miss out that big chunk of the, the summer in the middle. And in terms of what you can do about it, 
if you don't play in, in July and August, there's nothing you can do about it. Zero. Mm. Absolutely zip. Um, and so what you're, what you're looking at is then being able to send, you know, sending players to, uh, or sending coaches maybe even, to, be, to, to sort of go over to Sri Lanka and India and, and bring back knowledge and be able to impart it to players whilst they're not actually playing, but maybe they can practice in that way back at home as well as sending the players themselves off to go and uh, to, to work on those aspects of their technique. Mm. But it's gone. You, unless, unless you play at that time of the year and unless you have the natural occurrence of the conditions changing through the course of an English summer, there isn't anything you can do about it. And any time you try to artificially insert a certain type of conditions um, into the game, there are always unintended consequences to doing that. And so the best thing to do is to is to allow the seasons to do what they do to a natural growing surface, grass, um, and then have the players adapt accordingly. Do not adapt the conditions in order to to force the players into a change. Allow the conditions as they are to force the players to change themselves. You see what I mean? There's a, there's a, there's a massive difference in artificially asking the uh, ask changing the game by changing the conditions than there are having asking the players to adapt to the conditions that confront them yeah um and there's and it's so dangerous to do that we do it all the time in english cricket we've done it forever you change the ball you change the seam you, you're heavy roller no heavy roller toss no toss leave the game and allow the players to adapt to it don't do it the other way around because it does not work mm. Well, specifically for, for batsmen, if you are playing so much of the season in April, May, where it's harder to bat, um, I remember Stephen Fleming said something really interesting in commentary in the winter during the New Zealand home summer. He said that um, when he was coming through, um, there wasn't a great talent pool in New Zealand cricket. So he kind of just got over-promoted throughout his whole career, even from a youngster. So he never learned the art of scoring hundreds. And that that continued to, to, for him into the test game. Mm-hmm. Do you think there's a danger for young batsmen in England if it is if it is harder to bat in the early months of the season that they actually just don't learn the art of scoring hundred? Is that something that well, you just do learn? No, I, I, I think what I think what happens is I thought what used to happen would be that again you would have this natural the natural idea where you were kind of looking to be very tight and very you know try try and play for your off stump, try and leave the ball as much as you possibly could when the conditions were challenging in the early part of the season in the knowledge that you would get the chance to bat when it was better later on. You know, mm. you, it, would be worth, it would be worth going through some of the pain and trying to hang in there and, you know, perhaps try and wear the attack down, all of those other cliches, which are cliches because they're true. Because at some point, the thing would change. You'd turn over. Over the course of the season, you would make up the runs that you didn't make in the beginning. But if you don't have that bit in the middle where you can make up the runs <laughs> in the beginning, you start to fret, you know. There is nothing wrong with there's nothing wrong with the conditions being challenging early season. That's how you learn to play again, you know, for twenty overs when the ball's hooping and doing stuff in Australia. That's where you get the little the little inserts of batting and bowling information in your game. But if you miss out on the chunk in the middle, if you don't have that bit in the middle, you you're kind of like you're, well, we're battling here and now we're you know, now it's now it's spinning square at the end. We haven't where's the bit in the middle where I'm supposed to score my runs, you know? <laughs> and, so, and that's really tough. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm fortunate that I never, I didn't really encounter that. The, the T20 season kind of, it took out part of the middle of the summer, but you were still playing the odd, you know, you'd go back to four day cricket in the middle of it and uh, et cetera, et cetera. You would never have this situation where you were just blank. It's just, it's white ball. It's pin the ears back and swing for the two best months of the summer. Um, and, and so I have a lot of sympathy. I have a lot of sympathy with batters and bowlers in that, in that case. I don't think it, it only adversely affects one group. Um, you know, and, it, and look, it's no fun. I mean, we're looking out at the, the Oval at the moment, and it is freezing out there. The guys are all in bobble hats, and you know, the, it, it's you, you know, it's, know it from the it, sky though, would you? you yeah. the sky <laughs> is quite nice, but it's it, it isn't. It's not take out the temperature. It, you know, you're desperately excited to get out there in the middle again, but it's you know, it's a real challenge playing yeah. cricket in these conditions. It's supposed to be a warm game. That's why you stand still for most of it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> So uh, you know, I, I I have I have a lot of sympathy, and it and of course it affects it will affect development in all kinds of different ways, in ways that I probably haven't even imagined because I didn't go through, I didn't have it, I didn't have to, I didn't have to work out how I was going to be a cricket player, um, whilst having sort of large chunks of the season taken away from from one art and given over to another. Mm. Um. On, on a more cheery note, ahead of the start of the season, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> uh, Tara, what's what's your moment of the week? 
Um, well, it was um, sat here at the Oval on Friday um, watching Ollie Pope get some runs. Uh, it was freezing, but it was just nice to watch some cricket and kind of a nice reminder that we're only a few days away from the from the start of the season. And and Pope, you know, being Pope, he looked he looked pretty good. Yeah, there's a, there's a photo of him uh, wearing two shirts and three jumpers yeah. uh, when he was in the field that day. So yeah, it was it was, it did yeah, look it's really pretty, really it's pretty cold. chilly. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway. What? Yeah, go on. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, for all the talk of, of dates and time of year, I would say I, I like this county championship format. I think there's a, a lot to... It's nice that some counties are playing each other that haven't played each other for, for years. Mm. It's nice that everyone can win it at the start. Um, I think it's also nice that later on, there's not so much on every game that, that sides can experiment a little bit at the end as well, which should see some young players given a chance. Uh, the only thing I'd say, I think the Bob Willis final at the end is a bit odd, I think. It's a bit much for the championship winners to then have to play a game that they might lose and therefore not sort of win the, the final thing of the season. Yeah. I think I, I think that doesn't quite work. I wonder if that will stay. But I do think this structure um, of the championship could last beyond. I mean, it's in place because of COVID, but mm. I think it could last beyond that. I think there's quite a lot that's going for it. Well, speaking of Bob Willis, it was kind of like it was a, a template that he drew up around about the turn of the, the century to yeah, kind of, of course, have... Yeah. To have, um, you know, what do they call them? They didn't call them divisions. They were called something else. But anyway, to have, th- you know, th- three groups of three. I think, I think con- his con- his idea was, yeah, conferences. Yeah. I think his idea was more that you had to you had to escape them. You know, you, had, you were sort of stuck in your conference, and there would be ten championship games or whatever it was. This uh, this idea I like better um, because it kind of it because as you're right, you're right. It does actually give all of the counties a, a, a realistic. A realistic chance of, of the promotion into into the Division One is actually quite a quite a good prize, I mm. think. So, what you haven't done is stripped away all of the ambition from from certain counties, as you do with with two divisions, as it has been. Um, you know, there is there are a lot of counties with two divisions of nine, for whom promotion is kind of like you pay lip service to it at the beginning of the season, but your squad is entirely built around perhaps getting a bit of success in the in the one-day cups and the championship is an afterthought or it's a developmental side or whatever it might be but with this it is not it's not unrealistic for every single one to think well we can make it to division one and we get to division one you're in with a chance of winning the whole thing was and it I think, Derbyshire with, yeah. near, was pretty close uh, against Bob Willis final last right year. exactly yeah. so and I, and, I, and I think that that's I think giving allowing teams to have that that ambition and dream actually then will drive them forward to to up their standards in a way that two divisions of nine or maybe you know or the old 18 all in one never did mm. um so i so i like it and it'd be interesting to see how it goes nice well that's the end of the show thanks butch thanks Dar. thanks joe this has been the wisdom cricket weekly podcast thanks for joining if you liked what you saw or listened to hit the subscribe button tell your friends and we'll be back next week for the release of the wisdom now cheers <laughs>